afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of, or another episode of Sophie Live. Um, again, my name is Cesar, and welcome to Motivation Monday. In this special episode of um, Sophie Live, we are very happy to be joined by a friend and a very experienced individual in the in the field of um, politics, economy. And in, in the uh, and in the private sector, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by former finance secretary Margarito Gary Tevez. Sir Gary, thanks for joining us, and good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. And Jan. And Jan. So, um, I think, I think I have an echo. Yeah, it's fine, sir. It's fine. I can hear you. Okay. okay. My voice. My voice. Okay. How about now? Is it clear? Is it clear? It's bouncing. Yeah. It's fine, sir. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're good now. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can we begin? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just bouncing. Can I introduce? Ah, okay. Oh, so, so right now we are joined with um, Sir Gary. Um, and uh, this is a special episode of Sophie Live. Um, we are going to talk about um, Sir Gary's life in both in the private and the public sector. And also, he is going to talk about, um, he will be our speaker on how to be a successful a professional, especially in these times. So, I believe Sir Gary has a presentation, and later on, we will have. A Q and A session. Um, so those who are watching us on Facebook, you can um, send in your questions, and we will ask your very um, I I believe Jill will be the one to share your screen. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you very much, Jan. Can is it my turn, Jan? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, you can now start. Thank here. you again for the invitation, and uh, I brought along. Mike Saulo and Jel Pautan, my colleagues who principally prepared her charts. And thank you also, Jan, for providing us the guide uh, questions or outline uh, that might be useful or relevant to our listeners. No? So let me begin <clears throat> our presentation uh, with a chart on my life as a student. Yes, I was fortunate to have been exposed to some of the better schools in the Philippines and abroad. And uh, I was also able to take some summer jobs uh, to enable me to move around Western Europe without having to burden my parents. So in these summer jobs, I had the following uh, experiences in Holland. Go ahead, Jill, faster. This uh, in Holland, in Grass, Austria. I worked as a, as a dish digger in Germany, archeological excavation. And in London, which was the more difficult summer job, I worked as a dishwasher and a waiter. You know. Being a working student allowed me to learn something about money, the value of money. Uh, in fact, uh, I became a bit frugal and my sisters kidded their friends that I, I was so kuripot or in Cebuano, you know, that uh, I brought with me the same set of clothes that I brought to Europe, and after five years, I had the same set of clothes. So after that, uh, let's uh, go to my career in the private sector. I spent a total of 17 years in the private sector, and these are my various jobs. Can we show them, Jill? No. Executive training at the Bank of Asia, which is now part of Union Bank. We managed the 
sugar mill of the family in Santa Catalina. He worked for Ayala Corporation for almost 12 years. And then we also established Think Tank, an economic and political consultancy firm. Part of our work uh, on a pro bono basis is being a fellow of the Foundation for Economic Freedom, a group that uh, advocates for major economic reforms. I've also been assisting the Wallace Business Forum. And during my retirement year starting 2010, I've been lucky to serve as an independent director in a few companies. My career in the public sector lasted for about 27 years. So longer than my stay in the private sector. And I have basically been involved in the presidential economic staff, which was the predecessor of the National Economic Development Authority. I was uh, fortunate to have been elected as a delegate to the 1971-72 Constitutional Convention representing the first district at the time. And then I also served as the representative of the third district of Negros Oriental for 11 years from 1987 to 1998. I served as land bank's president and CEO for almost five years from September of 2000 to mid 2005. My last job in government was uh, being the Secretary of Finance from July of 2005 to 30 June of 2010. So altogether, I worked for 44 years, 27 of which is in the public sector and 17 in the private sector. The next thing is to address your question on what kind of style do I use? Basically, it's uh, what we call the de decentralized type of management, Jan. But during my stay in Lamba, at the beginning, we coined the word 90-10, the 90-10 formula. So when I met with my officers and staff, about 50 of them in the beginning, I asked them, can we work on the basis of a 90-10 formula? And they asked me, what is 90-10, sir? I simply said 90% of the work and creativity of the bank will be handled by you. And only 10% will be handled by me as your CEO. So it's like a bottom-up approach, decentralized. No? I'll talk about that more later. In communication, we follow what I call the SPT formula. So what is the SPT? S stands for substance. P stands for packaging. And T stands for timing. Now, substance is essentially what? What is it that you are presenting? Packaging is how do you present this? <clears throat> and timing is when will you be presenting this? <clears throat> now, why are these three questions quite important? Because we have to know what the subject matter is all about to be understood by our audience. The audience could be our supervisor or our CEO. The packaging is also important because uh, there are some technical subjects, for example, economics, Jan, that are difficult to comprehend if one is a layman. So I recall when we packaged our economic briefing for then President Estrada, my colleagues asked me, what is the level of education of President Estrada in economics? And I said, grade five. No, really, sir? Okay, what do you present to a grade five 
uh, audience. I said, well, not more than one or at most two pages of big fonts type of presentation, not more than five acetates. We didn't have PowerPoint presentation then with animation. So as clear as possible. What does timing mean? Timing is essentially when is a good time to present your paper or your idea to your bosses or to your clients? Well, an example of this is if you forgot to present to your boss, make sure that you know his habits. For example, he, would, he plays golf, make sure that he won in a golf game. No. If it's your wife, make sure that she won in a mahjong game before you present something to her. So that, those are the three elements in communication. Now, the next is more related to, I guess, interacting with clients, and you have many of them in your business, interacting with a big audience if you're going to speak, or being interviewed by the radio or television. And we use this word soften in British, S-O-F-E-N. What does soften mean? S is for smile, like we are doing now, so we're smiling. O is open posture. I'll show you what an open posture is. Open posture is like that I'm doing now, an open posture. As against a closed posture, we will do this. So an open posture is easier to, to communicate with. And then F is forward lean, which is similar to open posture. You're close to the person you're talking to or the camera, like we're doing now. T is very important. It's the tenor of your voice. Try to speak from your stomach rather than your throat. E is for eye to eye contact. Always try to see the eyes of your audience. And nodding is also very important. I'm nodding like this. Well, what are the most important letters here? Smile is, of course, very important. Tenor of your voice is very important so you can be heard. Eye to eye contact so you will be remembered by your audience over a longer period of time. And nothing, nothing is very important, especially if you talk to your wife. You know, when you talk to your wife, you keep on nodding, she will think that you agree with her. She will smile at you and she will ask you, Oh, I've been talking. What about you, John? What can I do for you? No. So for a better relationship, keep on nodding. No. Now let's go to achievements. We were fortunate <coughs> that um, we had a few achievements as delegate to the 1971, 72 Constitutional Convention. This is a group that actually drafted and later on had it approved the 1973 constitution. We tried to amend the 1935 constitution. And then as a congressman, we served for 11 years in Negros Oriental, the third district. That is from Valencia, Bakong, all the way to Basai. No? And then as president and CEO, of Land Bank of the Philippines, as I mentioned earlier. And finally, a Secretary of Finance. Now, in going through these achievements from an earlier period, even as a student, and all the way to the time I finished my career in the public sector, like most endeavors, like most individuals, John, we suffered also some setbacks. Let me begin with my first setback when I was in first year high school at the Atenea de Manila University. There were six sections in first year as in other years. And in my section, there were 20 of us who came from Atenea grade school and 20 came from public schools. 
in the beginning, we were cocky. We were overconfident. And we would convey to our colleagues who came from Ateneo grade school, uh, we can outdo them. We're better than them because they came from public schools. Little did we know that the quality of the public schools was equal to or sometimes better than the quality of the schools, quality of education in private schools. So my first setback and embarrassment, John, was I found myself out of 40 in the 31st to the 40th group. So then I later told myself, I'm not that intelligent after all no, compared to my classmates. The next uh, was in Ayala Corporation where I worked for almost 12 years. Actually, had I not gone into politics, I would probably have continued and retired in Ayala Corporation. My setback there was the first three years, John. Why? Because I thought that in the initial years, I would be promoted every year. Unfortunately, this did not happen. I did not get my first promotion until after the third year. So you could imagine the anxiety that I went through and the setback. So I had to do something about it, which I will convey later. In politics, uh, maybe some people did not know that I also suffered setbacks in politics. I lost in the 1984 election for the uh, Batasan Pambansa. And then, of course, a more recent one when I ran for governor in our province in 2013. Another that I thought was a setback, but in the end it turned out to be a blessing, was I was not included among those who would run in the senatorial slate in 1998 in the party of then former president Fidel Ramos. So those were my setbacks in terms of health. I also suffered during my stint in the Department of Finance. I had what you call pancreatitis. pancreatitis. In, in Tagalog, it's balo. I forgot the term it is. Anyway, it has something to do with the stomach associated with stress. <laughs> I lost 11 pounds during that period. Now, how did we overcome? these setbacks? Well, we began with our first experience in high school. We began to study harder, harder than the average because we had some inadequacy. As I mentioned before, I realized I was not as intelligent as I thought. And then we began to work on what we term as intelligent effort. What is intelligent effort? It's a way of doing things uh, and you're trying to come up with the result without putting excessive effort or at least something that is likely to be successful. So a lot of adjustments, trying to learn from the experiences of others. And it is uh, different from just purely working hard. Intelligent effort is very important in any endeavors. And then a very important part of uh, overcoming the setback is what we call focus. If you look at the more successful people in any endeavors, John, they have a certain focus. Let me try to illustrate what this means. When I went to work for Land Bank, I consulted with most of the presidents in Land Bank. And the one that was really very helpful was the first president of Land Bank. And he asked me what I should be doing. And, and I asked him, well, I don't know, maybe you can tell me. You served for 13 years in Land Bank. And he told me there's one important thing that you can do, Gary. What is it, Stan? I called him Stan. Go back to the mandate of Land Bank. What is the mandate of Land Bank? to help, to assist the small farmers, the fishermen, the agri-entrepreneurs. 
not be like any commercial bank. We're being considered as any commercial bank, but we are a different bank. We should focus on helping the farmer. So how is that uh, going to take place? Well, we looked at the loan portfolio of the bank and we found out that 68% of the loans given by land bank went to commercial borrowers and only 32% went to the small farmers. So that I understood. So we decided to change this by convincing our colleagues in the bank that we should reverse the situation. We will try to allocate 65% of the loanable funds of the bank to our mandate and only 35% to commercial borrowers. The next is customer service. What does customer service mean? Traditionally, we talk of customer service as external customers, but we said no. Customer is both internal and external. We have to make sure that we treat our internal customers well so they can help us in delivering our mandate. So what does this mean? We look at the various uh, situations of our officers and staff. We found many of them still in OIC capacity, officer in charge, acting capacity. And so we made some adjustments. I say officers in charge should not stay more than six months. Those in acting capacity, we should decide on them within one year. So that's some more help. And finally, profitability. Although we are an agri-bank, we said to ourselves that we are being monitored by the Bank of Central, and we have an obligation to the government that we should remit 50% of our profits to help them in their various endeavors. So the sum total of this was very, very helpful, very pleasant because we were able to reach and attain our mandate by 2004, Jan. We hit the 65% in 2004. I believe we were able to uh, relate better to our customers because we were processing loans faster from a, an average of 120 days to an average of only 45 days. And we were able to provide incentives to our officers and staff. One type of incentive that we devised and which was approved by the board and subsequently by the president was to give what I told or I related to us institutional profit. For example, out of the 4.3 billion that I mentioned, I asked the board, can we allocate 100 million to be given to our employees and officers. But this one is going to be different. Each one will receive the same amount regardless of his position. So a janitor will get the same amount as the president of the bank. So at that time, the 100 million was equivalent to 30,000 pesos each of the, for the employees. Now let's go ahead on the other items. Oh, here's very another important thing, focus on team versus individual talent. Sub, 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 subconsciously, I think this was something that had to do with my experience in high school. I thought that having that in, in, inadequacy of not having a very high IQ, I had to rely on team effort. And that's why the, the hallmark of my style is really on team effort. The team is more important than the individual. No, I could not handle a project without a team effort in most cases because a project normally requires a combination of talents. No. And, late, and then late, let's see the importance of EQ and LQ in a career path. No. Oh, I mentioned already improved communication uh, 
well, I mentioned about my my uh, my problems in la, in uh, in the in Ayala Corporation, for example. So when I experienced that I did not get the promotion that I wanted, I look at myself in the mirror and ask, "What's wrong with me?" And I found out that I was not communicating very well, not in the English sense or English language, but communicating from the heart, really understanding and being very passionate with the way I conveyed my ideas. You know? So eventually this improved. Of course, the environment was also different. I was lucky that I had a different bots and we sort of gelled together. So that accelerated my promotion. I was able to compensate for the very slow promotion during the early years. You know? And now let's go to EQ and LQ. Okay, there are three elements. IQ, everybody knows what IQ is all about. That's uh, intelligence quotient and that I mentioned already earlier. EQ, most already also know what EQ is. It's about, it is emotional quotient, emotional intelligence, interpersonal relationship, dealing with feelings, trying to make sure that when you convey something, you, you also think about how the other person would feel on the things that you would convey to him or her. So that's EQ. Lately, there's another phenomenon called the ALQ, and that is love quotient. It's more than EQ because it has something to do with what, you call, what we call the intelligence of the heart. Can you imagine the heart has intelligence too? No. It's being very kind, very compassionate, very caring, all of that. Now, why are these three elements important in a career? Let's see the next chart, Jill. If you look at this career path, this is the corporate ladder, here is a, uh, an employee, in the beginning, he relies heavily on his IQ. But IQ will not be sufficient to move up in the corporate ladder without improving his EQ, emotional quotient. Finally, he will reach his pinnacle or the height of his career if he has a powerful combination of IQ, EQ, and LQ. Well, EQ and LQ can, are, are, would be acquired. IQ is innately within us, but of course, as we try to reach a higher level of education, somehow the IQ will also improve. But try to remember the, power combina the powerful combination of IQ, EQ, and LQ. Next chart. Well, I practically went through the, the series of uh, experiences that we had from my early years in, in school all the way to the time I finished my career in government. The next is life after politics. Is there something? after you retire from the company or from, in my case, from politics or government, which was my last job. Yes, of course there is. And some of them were pleasant surprises. For example, I didn't realize that I would be taken in, in a few companies as directors, consultants, advisors. So I'm still active, maybe not the same as before in terms of really making decisions, but performing what we call oversight functions. That's the role of most uh, independent directors. No? And then we start still are able to communicate and, and test our ideas through these advocacy groups like the Foundation for Economic Freedom. And as I mentioned also, 
life is a little more balanced now. I have time for more exercise. I can do a lot of reading in the computer. And luckily, I am not experiencing the kind of stress that we had during my stay in government. So let us then conclude our presentation. We went through this journey with you, starting with our life as a student, conveyed our experiences in the private sector and government. We tried to share with you our management style, which by the way, may not always work. Some companies, uh, by the way, uh, use uh, decentralized approach, some leaders approach. What is important is what works, you know? And then it's very important to experience setbacks because it's setbacks that really allow us to learn and do better as we progress in life and in our endeavors. The one thing that I probably regret is having a more balanced life. Unfortunately, I spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of time, more time in work. I should have had a little more balance in terms of my family time. So that's it. I'm hoping that some of this, uh, Jan and your colleagues, some of this will be helpful and relevant to them. And if there are any questions, uh, my colleagues and I are will be happy to answer some of them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, um, sir, for sharing your uh, your experience. We have um, quite some questions, and uh, we'll start with um, one question from our colleague. This um, this was sent via private message. Sir Gary, in your um, opinion, which has been more valuable in your career? Is it your education or your experience? Actually, both. Uh, let me try to amplify that a little. Education is like a passport, Jan. It allows you to have an entry point. So <clears throat> the higher your level education, the better are your chances to enter good companies or join good companies. But it's really you already. Once you enter that company, it's no longer your education that will matter. It's how you perform, how you interact, how you develop your EQ, your LQ, and move up in the corporate ladder. So on the net, I would say it's your experience, but you need that passport to be able to enter a good uh, company or learn the tools that will make you uh, more successful or the tools will enable you to become more successful in any endeavor. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. We have a question from Johanna Monares on Facebook. What is one thing or advice you would give to new or established but struggling young professionals? Can you repeat the last phrase, the new and? Um, what is the one thing or advice you would give to new or established but struggling young professionals? Uh, young professional. Well, I would ask them first, where do you want to go? Do you want to have a career? in a corporation? Do you want to have a career as a, as a businessman or an entrepreneur? No. Um, then there will be some variances, Jan. I would say that other things being equal, it would be best to start with a company. You know why? Because in a company you develop an understanding of human interaction. You interact with your colleagues, with your bosses. You learn some tools that are important like accounting, bookkeeping, all this, which can then be used by you when you set up your own business. You've gathered some experiences and you've learned something that you can use in interacting with your new set 
of uh, employees or officers. No? But of course, it's not always the same. Some would like to go to being an entrepreneur right away. And there are likely to be more mistakes uh, as an entrepreneur. It's fairly more or less risky to go through a company first. So if you don't have enough resources and you want to learn, it's probably prudently done going through a company for a few years. And then ask yourself, maybe it's about time that I can be on my own. No. Okay. Um, we have one question from Leia Flores, sir. How do you create um, motivation for yourself and your team? Well, for myself, uh, I have to know what the mission is all about. No. Secondly, I have to know what is the composition of my team. No. And then I relate both the mission and the, the various circumstances that would allow us to reach our goal. No. And then, of course, related to that will be a financial reward or a reward that will be in the form of promotion. No. It's also very important when it comes to the team to recognize their contribution and to credit them for their contribution. You are there if you're the leader as the one who will lead, but you cannot perform well without the support of each and every member of your team. You have to communicate with them that each is important in arriving at your goal. And you have to monitor the progress of your work, making sure that you are on track, you are able to deliver on time and within budget. So those are the elements of how you can be successful. In, in relation to that, sir, especially now that um, there is a hybrid um, work um, um, set up, you know, you don't get to see or talk to your to your staff or officers more often. So how do you think managers or leaders should adjust, especially when reaching out and giving feedback? I think communication and feedback is really important. And, you know, in, in fairness to some managers, they wouldn't know that, oh, this the staff are not motivated enough to do their jobs. They're thinking of quitting their jobs because a lot of reasons. What should what what do you think should managers do to reach out to their to their to their subordinates? Well, uh, well uh, I, uh, I think my voice is bouncing back again, Jen. Yeah. yeah. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. First, uh, you have to have a game plan. No, you translate your your agreement or ideas into uh, what I call a schedule of activity. You have what I call a schedule of activities by weeks. So first week, second week, third week, fourth week, until you reach your goal. So you meet as regularly as possible, maybe weekly to monitor the progress on a week to week basis. And if there are some difficulties within each week, you can kindly make sure to uh, overcome them as soon as possible. It's better always to be ahead of schedule, but that doesn't always happen. So you've got to get them involved. You've got to talk to them uh, individually and as a team, individually because some might not be able to deliver according to expectations. So you have to do it separately so that he doesn't get embarrassed. You know? So you have to do a combination of in the beginning as a manager and as a leader. I will try to make a distinction later on on what is a manager and what is a leader. But yeah, um... uh, in a small group, it's usually uh, going through a task. What is the task involved? How do I arrive at this destination? What are the elements that are necessary for me to contribute my share in that group? All of this will have to be uh, taken together. 
in relation to what you mentioned about the feedback, um, I remember oh, yeah. one of the stories oh, that okay. you told great. us. Uh, yeah. You have to give a feedback, Jan. You know, as we used to say, a good or bad feedback is better than no feedback at all. In other words, if yes. a, a, a member of your team makes a report to you, verbal or in writing, you've got to give him a feedback because it's a manifestation of your caring for him. No? If you're the manager or leader, you have to tell them that you are doing well, you're, not, you're in the right track or you have to make some adjustments. No? That is feedback. The worst thing is no feedback. So please try to continue with the feedback. Bad or good, let's have a feedback. Uh, can you tell us about the story about um, how you communicated to former president Gloria Arroyo, sir? I think that's uh, also yeah. an example of feedback when she offered you the position of finance secretary. Okay. You know, um, the former president Arroyo was known for her temper, no? Okay. And it was very difficult for me to agree to working for her eventually because of her temper and at that time, she was also very unpopular. But finally, after discussing this with my family and close friends, they said, you have to help Gary. Is the president asking for your help? Okay. So we had a 15-minute talk in the residence of her father's, right? Of her father, yeah. So at the last stage, John, I asked her, mom, can I ask you something? But I was smiling, so it didn't sound surprised. So I asked her, uh, in case I do not do well in your mind, or I happen to fall short in the del delivery of my uh, task, I, I did this in a very slow manner, Jan. I asked her, can you kindly, I'm smiling at her, I'm smiling at you now, can you kindly scold me in private and she laughed at me heartily. And she said, Gary, you know me very well. I'm very bad. I have a huge temper. I throw telephones. So that was lucky for me because I think there were times when I thought she might have been angry with me, but she remembered our conversation. So it's also very important for you to know your boss. No? And yeah, in relation to that, sir, but, um, how, uh, how would you, especially if you're a newbie in, in a company, in a team, how, how what would be your tip to those? What's your tip? Uh, how in getting to know your boss, especially the management style and how he or she communicates to the officers and staff. Okay, uh, for example, you write a memo to your boss, John. Well, there must be a feedback. Some feedback can be very harsh. Some can be very kind. I remember even when I was uh, at an earlier. Stage in the early stage of my career, my, my feedback was a little harsh. So I would specify the areas in the memo itself. So there are a lot of marginal notes in the memo. You know? So sometimes the, the officer or employee would come back to me about five times before I would be satisfied with his or her word. You know? So there has to be, but it has to be one. You have to clip the the memo so it won't be read by other employees, but just by himself. The other way of doing it is, is call him. John, can you see me in my office? But I'm ready already with the feedback. I have my marginal notes. And I go through these marginal notes and try to make sure that uh, you understood what I meant in these marginal notes. But it's OK because it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's very difficult to do that when there are yeah. employees. No? So as much as possible, if we are managers or leaders, try to do it one-on-one -on -one in private. Try not to do it if possible. I mean, we all make mistakes. But if we're conscious about it, I think that would be very helpful in terms of your relationship with the employees and the other members of the organization. Feedback, but try to package the feedback in a way that is uh, going to be clear but not to hurting to the employees. Uh, as if you could see, 
it becomes hurting if you scold him in public. Yeah, I think um, one common issue right now, sir, is how you motivate your real employees um, in their work. Uh, one is monetary, but monetary incentive is only limited. What do you think are the other um, yeah. rewards yeah. that would motivate um, employees to do well in their job and to keep them in, in, in work and, you know, without them leaving the organization? Okay. okay. The one that you want to help me, uh, oh, again, there's the echo. Okay. Can you try to work, work on the echo again? Sure. Yeah, you're okay. Now. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The one I thought might have helped, I, I don't know. It will have to come from the employees or the officers themselves. But I thought that was what was helpful in this team effort is to recognize the, the work done by your colleagues, by your subordinates. So as much as possible, when there's a memo that comes out from your office, and it was done by Jan Pitong or Jill or Mike, try to put there, this was principally, or this was done by Jill or Mike or, or John. So somehow, I hope the officer or the employee will feel that you are crediting him for the quality of work that he gave you and which you were then able to share with your colleagues, with your clients. That is non-monetary. That is psychological, but very fulfilling that your boss recognized the quality of work that was given. So I thought maybe that's helpful. No. Okay, we have a question from Diane Flores, sir. Um, <clears throat> We can't deny the importance of connections in the public sector for one to thrive or even get started in that area. What advice can you give to aspiring young professionals who are having a hard time getting a job in the public sector? Well, if you go to well, the public sector, to... unfortunately, does echo again. Yeah, you're good, sir. In the public sector. <laughs> In the public sector, uh, normally you have to go through this examination called the civil service. You know, unless you are, you are you are entering at a very high position, but generally you go through the civil service exams. So connections are not needed there. You just have to go through that. You know, okay. So once you have the civil service exams, then. You just have to qualify. They have certain examinations, you know. And of course, the connections are useful, but connections will only be good if you are qualified. You now, if you're not qualified, then the person who is uh, trying to help you may be put at risk because later on, the institution that continues to receive recommendations from you uh, may not look kindly at your recommendees who are not really qualified or who are not doing justice to your having recommended him. So two things are important. You have to be qualified. And of course, it's very useful and very important to make sure that you also have people who can assist you. But the bulk of the work will have to come from you that you are really qualified for that position. No. So if you have difficulties there, then try to lock, try your luck in the private sector. In the private sector, there are also elements of connection needed. Yeah. But then, as I said, it will have to come from you. No. I, I, cannot, I could not have worked in the presidential economic staff or all those where I went through if I were not qualified, no. So you still have to attain a certain level of qualification. Yeah, because I think um, it's a common knowledge now that you know, if, 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 if you want to work in a government, even a low LGU, you have to know someone for you to be able to be a regular employee. Although that's, that's, that's um, a very long story, but it's, 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 it's a bit hard right now, but again, um, it also depends on the person applying yeah. and the policy. As I said, it's helpful to have the connection, but more fundamental than that would be your own self 
your own qualification, John. No. Okay, I have a, I have a question, sir. This is relation in relation to our clients, Sophia, um, or in especially in most um, businesses, new businesses, because we work with startups, new companies. Um, what do you think should be the process of selecting the right team for 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 your organization or company? The right team, the right team. What the right team? The right team. The right team. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, again. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Back again. The, the team is associated with a task. Yeah. No? You have to have a task, a mission, and then you try to come up with a team that will be able to perform the task at hand. No. You cannot have a team without a mission. Okay. So from the mission, you go to the kind of team that you need. You know? And usually the manager or the leader will then come up with the composition of the team that will enable that team to perform in accordance to expectations. You know? So it could be a team of one accountant, a team of one analyst, a team of one engineer, that's how it works. So it cannot work on a vacuum. It has to be related to the mission. You know? uh, for example, a, a recent one that Jill, Mike, and I work on, uh, we worked for a project, but I knew that Jill and Mike and somebody else would for, be able to perform. They did most of the work. They did 90% of the work, and that's why we were able to accomplish our mission on time ahead of time, things like that. So that, that the process will have to be clear. You know? One should also know what kind of budget, whether the budget is sufficient to perform the mission or the task, okay? Yeah. Um, again, relating to this to startup, sir, you know, the, the, the Philippine economy and the, the global economy is in shambles right now. What, what could be the, best way to, to counter this? Do you think in the future, in the, in the coming years, there is still um, a possibility of um, new businesses popping up, um, even with the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's great that we would be talking about uh, the economy. We could probably discuss this uh, in another setting. But uh, Jill and Mike came out with... Uh, some businesses that can thrive during the pandemic. No. Mm -hmm. There's one, one sector that is normally resilient regardless of the condition, and that's food, no, the food sector. But the components of the food are what we might be looking at so that our would-be entrepreneurs can take a look at some of these components. But you cannot go wrong with food, no. Uh, the basic things that are needed, you no, know, food, transportation, or logistics, you no. Know. But as I said, uh, I can re only recall from memory. I'd rather maybe at some time we go through this more carefully. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. Again. So um, going back to the the team composition, let's now talk about the decision making process of a team, sir. I believe you have something prepared for this, and you know. Um, the decision-making process, and we can also talk about, you know, testing four ways uh, or that the ways that how to test major decisions. And perhaps you can give us an example on, on um, let's say, how you saved our economy. Although in the 2008, okay, um, um, to those who don't know, Sir Gary was the was one of the people who who saved our, the Philippine economy during the 2008 um, economic crisis. Well, thank you very much for the generous compliment. It was really a, a combination of team effort and uh, something that we did and something that was done by my predecessors. Uh, we can start off with that before Jel will show us some of the charts related to your questions, Jan. In 2008, <clears throat> We had a global financial crisis, John, remember? But we were lucky because at the end of 2007, to our surprise, 
we registered a surplus in our budget. What does a surplus mean? Meaning the sum total of our revenues from taxes, from the sale of assets, exceeded our expenditures. No? That was the first time. In fact, we didn't expect to balance our budget until about 2010, which was then suggested by President uh, Arroyo. But I really actually asked her, ma'am, can I try balance? Can we try at balancing the budget by the end of 2008? So we were still one year ahead. We were in Davos, Switzerland, and I conveyed this to the president. And I said, ma'am, I just got news that we had a surplus. What, we had a surplus? So what do we do about it? Ma'am, can I suggest that we register a small deficit? Why? Because if we register a surplus now, officially, people will be asking us and be expecting us to have a surplus every year, but it cannot be done now. So luckily, since we didn't anticipate the 2008 financial crisis, we use those savings, John, which we put in our government financial institution to spend, to counter the effects of the global recession. So we were able to save jobs. And in 2009, we were lucky that we were the only country in Asia that did not suffer a contraction, a negative growth rate. We had a positive growth rate and we had the lowest deficit as a proportion to the economy or GDP. So we were benefited by policies that were done even during the time of Arroyo, the very controversial and popular expanded value added tax, remember? And of course, we had to dispose of some properties, but we can do it in the real world. We just have to go back to going through a family budget, Jan. No? Look at your expenditures, look at your income. Make sure that you distinguish what spending is. Spending for needs, N-E-E-D-S, and spending for wants. Do you know the difference between needs and wants? If, for example, you're only one yes. in that household and you have one car and all of a sudden you want three cars, the two extra cars are wants. They're not needed. So that happens in a family as it does in government. No. Anyway, That's also a good tip to our young professionals now, sir, especially to those who are just having their jobs, who, who, who yeah. doesn't, you know, having be a hard careful. time balancing. <laughs> be careful not to overspend or because you it might result in you over borrowing and it, it can get you into trouble, especially in circumstances like this. No. In fact, in circumstances like this, we need to save no, because we don't know how long the pandemic will last. No. So let me go quickly to the charts prepared by Jill on some of the things that you asked, Jan. Uh, Jill, can you show some of those optional charts? No. Yeah, well, this is a decision making process. And in any kind of decision, you go through what we term as knowing the risk on some mga uh, things that might affect your expectations. And what are the rewards? <clears throat> the rewards will be, what is the result of taking that risk? There's a saying that high risk should be associated with huge rewards, it's fine. But it also depends on your appreciation of the risk. No? If you're overly optimistic, you, you might think that the risk is so small and you expect some rewards. And that's why some people go into what you call speculation instead of prudent investment. This is uh, going to be very general, not necessarily true in all occasions, but I would say in the early stage of your career, in your 20s and maybe late 30s, you are what I call aggressive in your decision-making. You tend to make some aggressive decision. No. Then in your 40s to mid 50s, with your learning, with what you've learned in the office, with experience, and with those uh, setbacks that you're able to learn from, you become highly aggressive. This is also, by the way, what I call the most productive years, 40 to mid 50s. No. Sure, say, by, sorry. Sir, by saying aggressive, what does it 
mean um like you, you instantly you 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 make this, this decision immediately without getting a proper thought of the outcome relatively relatively because it's really in in the way you appreciate risk versus reward jenna okay so i don't know if some of you might have played poker now if you are for example if some of you know what an inside straight is let's say 10 jack queen king ace that's a straight right mm -hmm. now if you if you are a gambler even if you are waiting for a middle card if you're waiting for a middle card what's a middle card 10 jack queen is a middle card right 10 jack queen king ace okay you're waiting for a queen that's highly risky because it's one out of so many cards only that you will get. Mm -hmm. Now, as against somebody who is waiting for a, an end and, and a beginning, for example, the same, it's 10 jack, queen, king, is better than 10 jack and you're waiting for a queen, the middle card. No? Because if you get a nine, you can still get a straight, John. Nine, yeah. ten, jack, queen, king. If you get an ace, you can get a straight. No. So there are it's less risky than the one that I described early. It's not a question of not 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 thinking about the result. It's just uh, getting a feel that I can be more aggressive. I can take more risk because I think uh, I will be able to get my reward. No? Ah, okay. So okay. it's more on feel rather than on statistics. People try to be more aggressive if they rely less on statistics or for what they call probability. No? Okay. Okay. okay, sir, go ahead. That's how it is. It's just a description of the kind of decision making as one gr grows older. So when one reaches 50 to 65, I add the word prudent. They're more prudent now. They're not as highly aggressive as the ones in the 40s and mid 50s. For those 65 and above, like us, we become more prudent, we become more conservative. No. So we're not the kind of decision makers that are sometimes needed, at least in the 40s to mid 50s or mid 50s to 65. That is why in most uh, uh, companies, they try to bring in younger people, right? Because they're more energetic, they're more aggressive, and try to retire older people because they're no longer as aggressive. No. But the process is the same. You just have to go through an appreciation of risk versus reward, and you have to discuss that with the team. See if there's a consensus on what are the risks and what are the rewards. No. Okay. So we're done with this decision-making process. Let's see another chart. And this is a four-way test and test a major decision. When I was in the Department of Finance, John, for major projects that require really thoughtful decisions, and especially to those for projects that I'm not too familiar with, I usually go through these four tests, similar to is it the Rotary or Lions, is it legally feasible? Especially because I'm not a lawyer. Correct? Right? So you can be questioned, you can go to jail if you go into a contract that has a lot of legal infirmities. So I don't uh, act on a project proposal unless it's thoroughly reviewed by my legal team. No? And then here is where my background comes in. Is it economically viable? No? But since I don't have the time to go through all these projects myself, I also have an economic team that will help me uh, appreciate the economic viability of a project now, especially the large one costing billions of pesos. Is it socially desirable? Does it add to employment? Does it add to environmental improvement in the environment? These are what is associated with is it socially desirable? Now, added to this is what I call, will it be accepted in Plaza Miranda? Plaza Miranda is this test of public opinion. 
or in the in the case of Negros Oriental, Plaza Quezon. No, Plaza Quezon is the venue for making speeches, showing uh, the pros and cons of a project. There is a major project right now in Negros Oriental, and mind you, I have not studied it. Sometime maybe we can talk about it, and that is the reclamation project. But even if you don't know the project yet, the details of the project, the discipline that you go through by going through this exercise, is it legally feasible? Is it economically viable? Is it socially desirable? Will help you form a more informed type of judgment on what your position is or will be on a major project like the reclamation. Another that I presented earlier is the SPT, substance, packaging, and timing. You have to know the substance. You have to know the technical, at least the layman's technical details of the project, that's the substance. The packaging is also important because issues like, did it go through a public hearing? No. Did it go through an, a discussion by the board of thorough discussion? No. And timing. Why is it presented now in an election time? Could it be presented sometime after the election? So these are the things that you normally go through. But as I said, this test can be done in a private uh, setting or in a public setting. The next is, uh, I think we have some traits of, uh, yeah, the traits of effective leaders. In any organization, you're going to generate some leaders. No. Some will be managers, but some will be leaders. In a small organization, the dividing line between leaders and managers will be quite thin. And depending on your style of management, you can be a leader or manager at the same time. For intellectual purposes, I just thought of uh, giving a, a fine distinction between leaders and managers. So let us, some, let us talk about some of the traits of effective leaders. Leaders normally focus on strategy and shaping the overall direction, values, and culture of the organization. The big picture, that's what leaders are more concerned about. Leaders are good listeners <coughs> and effective communicators. You have to listen rather than talk. Because by listening, you're able to uh, understand better. Remember Stephen Covey, John? Seek to, be, uh, seek to understand before being understood. No. Or the nodding, you nod first before your wife will say, okay, your turn. No. Communicator, it's best if you're a good leader. You, you think of uh, some leaders like the leader of... Uh, of uh, Singapore, the Prime Minister of Singapore, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, they're very good, effective communicators. They convey important messages in a very simple way. The test of a good communicator is whether you're a PhD graduate or a college graduate, you must be clear. And here I can give an example, John. Remember, I think I mentioned this to you, when a group of reporters came to me, uh, during lull times in Congress, because they did not understand some aspects in in uh, in the bill, the economic aspect. So I'd look at them straight in the eyes, and when the eyes did not move, then I said I was not communicating effectively. So I smile at them, I smile at them, and tell them, "Hindi ako maliwanag." That means I was not clear. I didn't tell them, you didn't understand me, correct? There's a difference, no? right? You didn't understand what I was saying versus I was not clear in my explanation. Is that correct? And I smiled at them. So those things are important. So as not to intimidate your listeners, the way you communicate with them, no? Okay? And even in an organization like Land Bank, when I was not clear, so I told them, I think I was not communicating very well. Instead of saying it in the American way, you didn't understand me, stupid. <laughs> so you must be able to communicate in a humane way. Okay. Then you continuously encourage, empower, and inspire. 
Now here is very important. Bring out the best in everybody. Credit them. Maximize their potential. Develop them. Because a leader should be prepared that his disciple will be better than him. He derives satisfaction when he sees that his disciple is better than him. So bring out the best in everybody. Another to motivate, to inspire our officers and staff, they lead by example, normally associated with honesty and integrity. I'll give you one example that happened to me in Land Bank, which I forgot, John. Again, back to Stanislaw. He asked me, Gary, you can do this. Be the first to come to Land Bank every morning and be the last to leave. I smiled at him. I have no difficulty being the last to leave, but being the first is something of a stretch or a struggle for me. Why? Because I'm a night worker. Well, you have to make adjustment. You have the first, you have to be the first to leave. So I have to make adjustment. Luckily, I decided to stay near Land Bank. So it was only three minutes away. I was able to come in earlier. So the other, if you can do it, try to be humble and have that high emotional quotient. And lately, LQ as well, love quotient. Be innovative. Don't be satisfied with your success because your competitors will come in and try to emulate your success. So be one step ahead. And finally, try to be accountable to the people you lead as a leader. You must be accountable. That's another way of motivating them. I am accountable to you. You're not accountable to me. A manager would say that. You're accountable to me. But the leader said, I am finally accountable to you because I'm the one leading you. Okay? So those are leaders. Now we go to managers. Here. Ha managers are highly organized, task and detail oriented. They look at the short term. They are the effective implementers. So that's why you have COO, chief operating officer of the company's vision and mission, which is handled by the leader. They're focused on the short term goals. What will be our profit this year? How are we going to attain that? They're Concern is what we call process management, budgeting. Make, make sure that there's enough money to enable us to attain our objective. We have the necessary skills in our organization to achieve our objective. We have the resources, the budget, and we make sure that we're able to reach our goal on time. So it's more focused, but focus in the sense that it's focused on the short term. Leaders are more on medium and long term, the direction. So you, you see the fine distinction, John, between managers and leader. But I said, it's different. I mean, situations can be different. You have leaders and managers in a big company, and they work well. In the end, as I said, in summary, it depends on the result, what works. But for, for intellectual purposes, you can see the distinction between leaders and managers okay all right thank you so much sir gary that was a very uh informative one hour <laughs> yeah sorry was, it's too long it's fine no it's, it's no it's really fine sir um we're we're um I'm getting a lot of um private messages um i'm also reading um some feedback from our office mates and they're really enjoying and it's really an insightful afternoon with you uh, well, although we, yes, sir. Thank you uh, to Jill, to Mike, and to you for your interaction. Uh, we were able to make some adjustments in our in our presentation because we had to make sure that we are relevant and useful to you and to your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time. Although, um, how are you with um, ECQ season three in Metro Manila? So right, right, yeah, that's right. Well, uh, it's a it's everybody's concern and the economy is suffering. So hopefully more people will be vaccinated. So the chances of being infected will be less and hope the chances of going back to normal will improve because uh, we have to go back to normal. A lot of people are suffering with this pandemic. Yeah. All right, so sir, what is, um, I'd like to ask your parting message to our viewers and thank you again so much for joining us this afternoon. 
Well, thank you for inviting me. That is uh, one of my major roles now to serve some of us as, as like a mentor, you know? mentor shares experiences, but I'd like to make sure that some of them are useful. Some of them can be the things that might be of use to you in any field of endeavor. You know? So I'll be happy that some of these uh, suggestions will really or can really be used by you so that it can accelerate your career in government or in the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. That, that was former finance secretary Margarito Gary Tevis, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you learned a lot um, in this afternoon's discussion. Before we leave, um, I'd like to give a special shout out to the Sophie's Support Division for your um, for also joining us this afternoon. And again, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Sophie Live, um, Motivation Monday um, edition. Join us again next time as we continue to give you more uh, informative talks on professional development. So this again, this is again Cesar Bitong. Stay safe and, and get vaccinated. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Thank you so much, sir.